Welcome to this Communion Sunday with the Table United Church of Christ of La Mesa. I'm Pastor Kelly and it is great to gather with you here online to worship God in community. Today we'll be reflecting on the story of the faithful struggle of our ancestors in faith like Jacob as he wrestled along the shores of the Javik River and the continuing faithful struggle that we are beckoned to not shy away from today. We'll also have the opportunity to bless one of our children in our church, Matthew Wishard, one of our rising fourth graders, will be receiving his own Bible today. And so you are all invited a bit later on to bless him in this stage of his faith journey as well. So I wanna make sure to invite you to grab some communion elements, whatever you've got lying around the house. What matters is that we gather together through Christ's spirit, one body, even across all the places we gather, that we all still come to the table, this communion table, that all are welcomed to. So grab those elements, grab a candle if you'd like to set this time apart as a way of remembering the presence of the holy right in the heart of our everyday lives. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Hey church, welcome to the presentation of a Bible for Matthew Wishard. We invite you to follow along with the printed words that will be on your screen a bit later on as we join all of our voices in our respective homes together, blessing this Bible and blessing Matthew on this milestone. So living God, you are the beginning of our journeys, our guide and our destination. Matthew, Matthew Wisher. Wisher. 
as, as your Sunday, Sunday school teachers, we have watched you grow in body, mind, and spirit. As you achieve this milestone of fourth grade, we give you your own Bible to guide you in your faith journey and to remind you that you are a member not only of God's family, but of this church family. So Matthew received the word of God. Its stories belong to us all and its words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another for we are the people of God. So you're welcome to take your present right there, your Bible that is just for you there. We've got a card as well for myself and our Sunday school teachers. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Matthew, Matthew while, while we, we are, are not, not able, able to meet in person, person for worship, worship and, and Sunday school, school. You, you remain in our prayers and our hearts. We, we hope this can be a way to explore your faith at home, home and we, we look, look forward to when we can meet together, together in person each Sunday. I'm joining all of our voices together now. As God's, As God's people in the community, we wholeheartedly support the faith development of this young man and his family. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. Together we commit to grow our relationship in God and in each other through worship, education, and service. This gift to you symbolizes this commitment. As a covenant community, we walk together. Thank you to each of you, and may you be blessed as you are a blessing to us, Matthew. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 30. During the night, Jacob rose, took his two wives, his two slave girls, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford at Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the gorge with all that he had. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him there till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not throw Jacob, he struck him in the hollow of his thigh, so that Jacob's hip was dislocated as they wrestled. The man said, Let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He said to Jacob, What is your name? And he answered, Jacob. The man said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you strove with God and with men and prevailed. Jacob said, Tell me, I pray, your name. He replied, Why do you ask my name? But he gave his blessing there. Jacob called the place Penel, because he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is spared. Here ended the scripture reading. Whenever I go to the beach, one of my favorite things to do is just hurl myself into the waves as hard as I can. I love charging the waves and feeling the strength and immensity of the ocean. I especially love somewhere like Wind and Sea Beach where there's the, the shore is sloped, I think, and somehow that makes the waves crash even harder. And they're even bigger and more powerful. Those of you who are surfers probably know more about that. But I'm the sort of person who relishes having something powerful to hurl myself at. And those of you who are in our Enneagram class earlier this summer will not be surprised to hear that. Uh, but I, I like the feeling of that pummeling. And you know, I might get knocked down, kind of get the wind knocked out of me, and then I like scramble back up the beach, I <laughs> catch my breath, screw up my courage again, and charge back in. This is something, it's a nice unselfconscious sort of thing to do. I think the ocean can bring that out in many of us, but it's also something that's humbling for me. It kind of right sizes me because it reminds me how very, very not invincible I am, but that there are immensities we can encounter that can both knock us down and knock the wind out of us. And also the same element can in another moment gently buoy us up 
when we need to rest. Hurling yourself at something immense and what you learn about who you are in doing so. That's what I notice in this text today. Jacob names this place as where he wrestled with God, where he hurled himself at immensities and lived. Jacob is the sort of person who, as long as it seems like he keeps moving, he never has to confront his demons. He never has to feel the full weight of the choices of his past catching up with him. He's lied, he's schemed, he's betrayed those closest to him for his own gain. Sometimes he's also loved really deeply. And all that is catching up with him now on the shores of the Jabbok River. He can't run from his past anymore. In fact, he's kind of retracing the steps of his past. He's moving on this journey from where he had struck out fleeing his homelands originally after he had tricked his dying father into giving Esau's blessing, his brother's blessing to Jacob instead of to Esau. He fled his homelands, went far into another country. Now he's retracing the steps of his past, the landscapes and terrains as he returns home. And so he's in this threshold moment of his life, this in-between place, right on the threshold between the water and the land along this shore of the river. And there's this stark moment where he's already sent like all the droves of his livestock that he's been traveling with ahead of him across the river. And then he sent his family ahead of him as well. And it's just him. For the first time in perhaps decades, he's alone. And his life, who he's been, how his actions have affected everyone else. It's finally able to catch up with him. He's been running and hustling for as long as he's been alive, but now on that north bank of the river, with the cliffs of the river gorge rising high over his head and the stars beginning to emerge in the sky, he is still for maybe the first time in his life. And there's something orienting about this moment when he is still. It reminds me of the wisdom you hear if you're like hiking in the wilderness. If you find yourself lost, the first thing to do is to stop moving. There can be this tendency in your panic when you realize you're lost to just like keep striking out in different directions, trying to find something that will remind you where you are and help you find your way back again. But you might just get more lost. Instead, what you need to do is plant yourself exactly where you are. Look hard at your surroundings. Catch your breath. Calm your panic and orient in all the ways you can. Jacob has been a little lost for most of his life. Never quite looking around to see how his actions affect others, to see who he's become. For the first time in his life, he catches his breath and he orients. And that's when he's confronted. And he finds himself locked in this solitary struggle with some force that he only comes to later recognize as God. And I wonder if you can think of a time in your life where you were locked in some sort of solitary struggle and you might not have known quite what you were wrestling with, the full shape, the full outline, but in hindsight, you come to recognize that it was something immense, that maybe it was God. I 
Or I wonder if in these present days, you're feeling a sense of frustration at God these days. That you're wrestling with anger at God. I wonder if you're feeling like, hey God, God of love and justice, God of goodness and peace. If you wanna show up, if you wanna manifest in a real way right now, this is a really good time. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. And I invite you to not shy away from that struggle. Because I believe that sticking with that wrestling, God will still stay locked in with us. You're not going to hurt God. God is not easily offended. In fact, God welcomes our rigor, our intensity, our unfiltered emotions, and our seemingly unthinkable thoughts. The God of Jacob, who we encounter in this story, is one who we can hurl ourselves at with all of our fury or hurt, our fears and our doubts. Because fighting isn't the opposite of love, it's just sheer resignation and withdrawal. And so too, I don't think that the opposite of faith is doubt or this wrestling with God. The opposite of faith is just apathy. And there are a number of images of this scene, like artistic renditions throughout the centuries. And they show this really sort of complex reflection of this story where the wrestling also has this like tenderness and intimacy to it. This is imaged sometimes like a dance or the embrace of lovers. You can see that in the image here. What our world needs and what the divine calls us to now is the opposite of apathy or resignation. It is staying in the struggle. One of my favorite theologians, Debbie Thomas, says the opposite of loving God isn't fighting God. The opposite of loving God is not giving enough of a damn to fight. These are hard days. But God can take whatever you can dish out. God is not fragile. God is everything. God is the greatest incarnations of love that we can imagine. And God is in our deepest shadows of the most internal places of our hearts that we are scared to even consider, let alone dig into and open up. God is all of these things and more. So what are you wrestling with these days? I invite you to put that into the chat together. What are a few words that speak to what you're wrestling with these days? And this won't stay online. The chat bar doesn't become visible. It's not visible after the premiere is over by anybody else online. So I invite you to name in a few words, maybe it's the six word story, of what you're wrestling with, what you're struggling with these days. I invite you to put that into the chat bar here and we can hold witness that wrestling together. Be witness and resonance to each other's struggles right now because that's some of what good church can do is hold space for the gritty realities of the things that we're like, I don't know what to do about this. The things we wrestle with daily. So what's a few words of what you're wrestling with lately? We'll take a few moments now. Come down from the stars, show your human scars. Tell me what it's like to believe. Through my Christ haunted thoughts that the loss is you bought. All the nights that you peopled with your dreams 
Well, I've got no answers for heartbreaks or cancers, but a savior who suffers them with me. Singing goodbye, Olympus, the heart of my maker, is spread out on the road, the rocks and the waves. have this image of God as one whose delicate sensibilities are easily offended, who's up on a fluffy cloud in immaculate white robes, that kind of newspaper cartoon version of God, far removed from our messy, indelicate, sometimes hurting or broken lives. So I'm glad that we don't have that God in this text, but that the most ancient witnesses of scripture offer us the story of a God who digs down into the mud with us. A God of dirt and sweat and blood and tears, who is the one who we can rail against, who we can hurl ourselves at, and who is also the one against whom we can rest, who holds us up like the great immense elements of our world that we can throw ourselves at, that we can charge into, that might pummel us and knock the wind out of us, yet also is the same element that we can lean back into when we're too tired to keep thrashing around ourselves, and that will hold us up so that we can rest. Amen.
And so now we come to the prayers of the people. You can either offer up your prayers by putting them into the chat bar here on the side, and we can be in prayer with one another in real time. Or you can email your prayer requests into officeucclm at gmail.com. And that's a way that we can be in prayer with one another throughout the week. And so now as a means of prayer, I wanted to offer up this brief reflection by an Ojibwe writer named Richard Wagamese. Uh, he died in 2017, but he wrote this really beautiful book. He's written a lot of books, but this one is called Embers, One Ojibwe's Meditations. And this reflection here seemed like the sort of meditation or prayer that Jacob might have offered up as an older man. Uh, reflecting on his life. So this is from Embers. Life is sometimes hard. There are challenges. There are difficulties. There is pain. As a younger man, I sought to avoid pain and difficulty and only caused myself more of the same. These days I choose to face life head on and I have become a comet. I arc across the sky of my life and the hard times are the friction that shaves off the worn and tired bits. The more I travel head on, the more I am shaped and the things that no longer work or are unnecessary drop away. It's a good way to travel. I believe eventually I will wear away all resistance until all that's left of me is light. Amen. And so now we come to share communion together. When Jacob felt like he was lost and couldn't keep striking out in various directions anymore, he oriented himself and encountered God. So too, I think this meal also is one that orients us when we feel lost, when we struggle. And I believe that Jesus gave his disciples this meal to share together, knowing that they would come to moments when they felt lost, knowing that they would come to encounter times where they had to figure things out and they didn't have any idea or blueprint for what to do next. So in lieu of knowing exactly what you should do, in lieu of having a plan in uncertain times, perhaps times you've never encountered before, this meal is one of those practices that can help reground us and reorient us when it feels like we are just drifting off in a thousand disoriented directions. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed into the hands of the authorities of the state and would later be killed, he gathered with his friends in an upper room, knowing that this practice of sharing a meal together would go on teaching them all they needed to know after he was gone and would orient them when they felt disoriented and lost. And so he took the bread, the common loaf that they had shared together, and he blessed it and gave it to them and broke it and said, take this all of you and eat. This bread is like my body, broken open for you, offered to you for the forgiveness of sins so that you might know that even as you feel broken and disparate, that you are actually one.
And in a similar way, towards the end of the meal, he took the cup, the common cup that they shared together, and he blessed it. And he offered it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink. This cup is like my blood, in that it ratifies a new covenant, a new way of being together in the world. As often as you drink of this, remember me. And remember who you are in me. Will you join your hearts in prayer with me? Gracious and loving God, pour out your spirit on these elements. Whatever we have gathered together in each of our own homes, knowing that we come to a common table, drawn together across the distances between us. By your spirit, may these elements, each of us in our own homes, be transformed into the means of nourishment of soul, as well as of body, mind, and heart. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this table is an open table. There's nothing that you need to do to make yourself good enough for it, correct for it. You don't have to repent of wayward ways. All you are invited to do is come and drink in, taste God's grace. We do this together with one another connected across all the places that we gather here online through the Christ Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. So take whichever sort of elements you have gathered in your home and may you know that you are invited to this table now for all things are ready. And will you join your hearts with me in this prayer of thanksgiving? Holy One, may this meal, this common, simple meal shared among us together, change us. May this meal transform our hearts so that we might be encouraged, that we might find fresh strength and new inspiration to transform your world. As followers of Christ, this is our calling, and may we be nourished here at Christ's table. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's me, Megan. Um, I would like to share with you why I think giving to the church is important. Um, it's because I love to see the family programs, the children's programs, uh, benefit from the gifts from the church. Every week my kids uh, get mail from the church and they love it. Um, I really appreciate that we see uh, the church doing so much good uh, with its resources, being a good steward of the resources. Um, so giving to the church is easy. You can mail a check. Uh, made out to the UCCLM or give using uh, PayPal using the yellow give button on our church website and Because it's the first Sunday of the month. I would like to remind you of the Deacon's Fund to help those um, who have an urgent need and With that I wish you a happy Sunday and We'll see you soon And so now, beloveds, as you go forth from this time, may you not fear the faithful struggle. May you not hide yourself in apathy, but may you lean into the wrestling to which this moment calls us, knowing that God will still buoy us up and never let us go. May you go in peace 
May you be well. Much love to you. Amen.